Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Are peptides freaking magic for healing, recovery, and everything else? I started using BPC-157, it was gone in two weeks. Yeah. What does BPC-157 do to your body? Why is BPC-157 illegal? Is BPC-157 a steroid? Why don't doctors prescribe BPC-157? Is it freaking magic? Let's find out, yo. Okay, we're just gonna get right into it today, interns, because we've got a lot to cover. There is a growing interest in peptides in the medical and scientific communities, believing they may hold the potential to revolutionize healthcare and wellness. You may not have heard of them because widespread use of them for performance enhancement or shall I say total health optimization is pretty new. The last 12 months have been very big for me when it comes to optimization. If there's anything that I can do to improve my performance, I'm gonna do it. In the fitness industry, people consider them a healthier alternative to traditional PEDs. Given their more natural, or at least more simple, chemical structure, even in their synthetic forms. People also praise their ability to target health issues with extreme specificity. Peptides literally address the fundamental root cause, the regenerative effect that that peptide can produce in the body. Soreness recovery, fat loss, increased energy, better sleep, brain health, heart health, bone health. Peptides really are a rather broad category. So in today's video, I will give a general overview of them and then touch on some of the most popular compounds, including their mechanisms of action, benefits, and their risks. However, it's important to first understand the science behind peptides and their potential applications because this can help us to lay a solid foundation for discussion. We'll start the video with the building blocks of peptides themselves, amino acids. Amino acids are molecules or organic compounds whose chemical structure consists of an acidic carboxyl terminal and a basic amino group that make up the proteins within all living things. Proteins play essential roles in cells, driving most cellular reactions, providing cell structure, and helping cells stick together to form tissues. So amino acids are essentially the building blocks for proteins. They are basically the bricks used to construct the protein house. Peptides are a short chain of amino acids, anywhere from two to 50. So you can think of them like a row of bricks, serving as intermediates between individual amino acids and fully formed proteins. This string of molecules, or row of bricks, is linked by chemical bonds, and any string that surpasses 50 amino acids is called a polypeptide. Just as we need a bunch of bricks to make a house, we need multiple peptides and even multiple polypeptides to make up proteins. Fellow YouTuber Joao from Joao's Lab, which is a channel dedicated to medical education, has an informative video on peptides in which he explains. A peptide bond is a type of covalent bond joining two amino acid molecules with shared electrons. Peptide synthesis, or the combining of amino acids to create peptides, is a natural process within an organism, or in vivo, that can be mimicked within a laboratory setting, or in vitro. In an organism, peptides are synthesized inside cells as part of normal biological processes. For example, ribosomes in cells assemble amino acids into peptides according to the instructions encoded in DNA and translated through RNA. In a laboratory, peptide synthesis typically involves chemical methods to link amino acids together in a specific sequence. This process allows researchers to create custom peptides for various purposes, such as for studying protein function, drug development, or as therapeutic or diagnostic tools. Think of it like the two amino acids condensing into one peptide. The process of peptide synthesis, also known as peptide condensation, involves three main steps. As explained by Jessica Forbes and Karthik Krishnamurthy in their book on the biochemistry of peptides, in the first step, an amino acid undergoes deprotection, meaning the protective groups which prevent unwanted reactions from occurring during synthesis process are removed. In the second step, the carboxyl group of the amino acid is activated by chemically modifying it to make it more reactive. Finally, the next amino acid is ready to be added to form a peptide bond. This is called coupling. The formula you need to remember is a carboxyl group plus an amino group minus H2O. These three steps are repeated, adding a new amino acid each time to grow the peptide chain to the desired length. From there, it is cleaved 
from the possible solid support material used, such as the resin bead or membrane it was attached to. All remaining protective groups are removed, and the now synthesized peptide is purified to remove any byproducts generated during the process. They have a specific structure for cell receptors that can influence sort of the actions of cells, cell behavior, gene expression. In terms of our building blocks or protein brick house analogy, one might use a sturdy base plate, a solid support, to construct the row of bricks upon. Once it is done, it is removed from the base, all extra pieces such as the leftover bricks or protective coverings are removed and it is cleaned of debris and dust, giving you a polished finished product. In this case, a synthesized peptide or row of bricks. However, this analogy best fits peptide synthesis within a lab, whereas in an organism, the process occurs naturally within the cell where the ribosomes, following the instructions encoded in the mRNA blueprint, are acting as the construction workers, rather than a chemist manipulating the chemical structure of the peptide to their liking. And while analogies are a great way to make complex topics relatable so that they can be better understood, they do not offer quite the same impact as actively engaging with the topic at hand. This video sponsor, Brilliant, provides a free and easy way to do this with a wide variety of science-related topics. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. This type of immersion in the topic is one of the most effective ways to learn. The Brilliant Learning Platform provides a uniquely effective platform that uses a first principles approach to develop understanding of material from the ground up. This method is six times more effective than watching lectures. And interactive problem solving, not memorizing, builds real knowledge on specific topics so that you become a better thinker, like a surgeon. I am a surgeon. With only a few fun-filled minutes spent each day, you develop a powerful daily learning habit that builds real knowledge that results in both personal and professional growth. Personally, I love the way that Brilliant takes complex topics, breaks them down into simple, easy to grasp lessons that are fun and engaging. And did I mention that their lessons are crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and other prominent educational groups? Don't wait to get started. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Chris Rayner or click on the link in the description. By visiting the link, you'll support the channel and you'll get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Peptides are involved in a number of the important processes in the body and have a wide variety of uses. They can act as hormones, neurotransmitters, enzyme blockers, signaling molecules, growth promoters, regulators of ion channels, infection fighters, therapeutic peptides, and wound healers. So peptides as a whole are very, very versatile. They are just a row of bricks that can be used to make different walls and eventually to make many different types of buildings. However, while peptides are indeed versatile, the function of a peptide is determined by its specific structure and properties, similar to how different types of bricks are used for different purposes in construction. The order of the amino acid chain, and consequently its resultant shape, will determine what the peptide is used for. In the human body, peptides work by binding to receptors on the surface of various cells and triggering intracellular effects with high affinity and specificity. Hormones and other messaging compounds are then released, which can influence your health, body composition, exercise performance, and recovery. That said, peptides can be found naturally in the body and can also be ingested through food, supplements, and prescription drugs. Peptides produced within your body are referred to as endogenous peptides, whereas peptides that enter your body from outside sources are considered exogenous peptides. As explained by Canadian IFBB pro bodybuilder Greg Doucette, who has a master's in kinesiology, many people believe this. Peptides are derived from amino acids. And so since amino acids are natural, then peptides are natural, right? Wrong! It's not that straightforward though. Exogenous peptides can be either bioactive or synthetic, and their difference lies in their origin. Simply put, bioactive is technically natural and synthetic is man-made. 
Bioactive peptides exhibit specific biological activities and have physiological effects in the body when ingested or applied topically. They can be naturally occurring, derived from plant or animal sources of protein, including eggs, dairy, meat, fish, grains, and legumes. But wait! There's more! Or produced through fermentation processes or enzymatic hydrolysis. And condensation is removing water, then hydrolysis is adding water. Exactly. Enzymatic hydrolysis is a process that breaks down large molecules into smaller ones using specific enzymes, resulting in easier to use components for various applications. This basically means peptides could also be produced naturally through the breaking down of proteins. They have natural structures and compositions and have natural effects, such as antioxidant and antimicrobial properties. In this review, written by Rahale Gambari on bioactive peptides sourced from marine life, antibacterial, antihypertensive, and anti-inflammatory properties were also noted. Essentially, these peptides can help you heal by influencing various cellular or systemic processes. Men's physique champion, author, and peptide advocate Jay Campbell, who we will be hearing from a lot in this video, gives us an idea of what we're working with. If you have a strong enough GHKC formulation, any of us took a knife and we just went like that, five days it would be completely sealed. So in addition to our consumption of bioactive peptides directly through food, they are often found in dietary supplements and skincare products. Collagen, which helps with skin structure, elasticity, and strength, is depleted in volume as we age, resulting in wrinkles and dryness. However, collagen-based peptide supplements may help with this, as stated in this study conducted by Mahela Adilupu et al. Do not sleep on peptides. Peptides are the it girl of the year and for good reason. Skincare is especially powerful when multiple peptides are combined together. Because collagen is essential for skin health, it's understandable then why it can also contribute to faster wound healing. However, surprisingly, it can also positively affect athletic performance as well. This 2021 study on potential relevance of bioactive peptides in sports nutrition, conducted by Daniel Koenig et al, demonstrates that collagen-based peptides increase fat-free mass and strength by stimulating the growth of muscle fibers. They also improve endurance and reduce joint pain while increasing mobility in both athletes and sedentary people. The study goes on to say that certain peptides can help with myotendinous adaptations, or changes in the muscles and tendons due to exercise, can induce beneficial adaptations within the connective tissue, and can accelerate recovery. These findings were echoed in a 2019 study on knee pain conducted by Denise Ziedlick, as well as in a 2022 review written by Shiloh Kivatsky. They were also confirmed in studies on activity-related knee pain published by the Osteoarthritis Research Society International. These studies were conducted to determine whether or not bioactive collagen peptides have the potential to serve as a preventative treatment in the development of joint disease. They showed that participants experienced significantly reduced pain in comparison to placebo. 37% compared to 25% in one, and 25% compared to 80% in the other, with the percentage indicating the degree of pain relief. However, as you can see, there was still a notable placebo effect, which I want you to keep in mind as we continue this video. Yes, collagen peptides is the fountain of youth. Had hip pain, I took two scoops, and within 30 minutes to an hour, it was gone. Now, this video is definitely not only about collagen, though we will be focusing primarily on peptides usage in the fitness industry and sports nutrition. In this case, other bioactive peptides typically used are creatine, casein, whey protein, and other plant proteins. Overall, the general consensus is that bioactive peptides can strongly upregulate muscle protein synthesis, increase muscular strength, and aid in recovery. Not only that, but they can also aid in fat loss. Good luck, Peter. <laughs> Moo! As explained by dietitian Julian Kubala, peptides are more easily absorbed by the body than intact proteins, alluding to their effectiveness for dietary purposes over, say, a protein-rich diet. This is more so an effect of the nature of the peptide structure, not any specific one. However, this can lead to improvements in satiety, weight management, and metabolism. 
I'm so <laughs> Bioactive peptides, such as opioid peptides found in certain foods, may also have beneficial effects on the brain and nervous system, contributing to a reduction in stress, anxiety, and depression, as pointed out in a 2020 review on the health benefits of peptides, published in a special issue of the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. Nootropic peptides, for example, CMAX and Seclank, are another category of bioactive peptides that may enhance cognitive function, improve memory, focus, and mental clarity, and protect against age-related cognitive decline. I thought this important to mention, since your mental health affects every area of your life and is intimately connected to your ability to perform well physically. Now, I know I've only covered a few bioactive peptides, but I just wanted to highlight some of the more popular types and bring your attention to how they are typically used in optimizing performance, both mental and physical. Just push through it, Brian. Once you hit your runner's high, you'll catch your second wind. Brian, this is your heart. What the hell do you think you're doing? Stop. In contrast to bioactive, peptides can also be synthetic. These are those made artificially in labs, those in vitro rows of bricks, using chemical or genetic methods. They are designed with specific structures for desired functions and can be tailored to mimic natural peptides or target specific biological activities. These are used for drug development, diagnostics, and research for specific purposes. Most of the peptides used in sports for performance enhancement are synthetic. As explained by Giacomo Rossino and his colleagues in their 2023 article on the challenges and opportunities of peptides, they are becoming increasingly more popular and are being considered the cutting edge of contemporary research for new, potent, selective, and safe therapeutic agents. Initially, scientists used natural hormones and peptides to treat diseases such as diabetes. They later improved these natural peptides to make them more effective and long-lasting, resulting in the creation of drugs like insulin and GLP-1 analogs for treating diabetes. Vanessa Urquez and Christian Stewart lay out the story of peptides in their article published in the Royal Society of Chemistry's Medical Journal. They state that peptide therapy officially began in 1923 with synthetic insulin being the first approved peptide administered by daily injection. As of 2020, there were 106 peptides approved, which if I were to guess, has gone up since. While I can't provide an exact number, they have been gaining increasing recognition and approval in recent years. A 2022 article written by Lei Wang et al. on the current applications and future directions of therapeutic peptides states that since 2000, 33 non-insulin peptide drugs have been approved worldwide. These include biomimetic peptides, such as enfervitide for HIV, neurotoxic peptides like ziconotide for chronic pain, analogs like tetaglutide for short bowel syndrome, compounds like liraglutide and semaglutide for type 2 diabetes and obesity, and many more. These peptides are made using advanced technology and are used in various medical fields, some of which include urology, oncology, and cardiovascular diseases. Currently, over 170 peptides are in active clinical development, with more undergoing preclinical studies. That's a lot of peptides, and as you can see, they are being used for a lot of different things. Longevity or life extension, and then we have healing, and then we have bioweapon protection. <laughs> so the market, which is now estimated at approximately $40 billion, is expanding for a few reasons. Mainly because, again, peptides use small compounds to target specific issues and can be really tailored to optimize every aspect of your health. They have heightened target specificity and potency, as referred to in the challenges and opportunities of peptides study I previously mentioned. So you can use a peptide to actually target an illness, a disease, an injury, you know, some sort of specificity. So basically, the solution can be sent directly <laughs> to the problem area, instead of simply treating symptoms. Thank you, doctor. Take two of these and call me in the morning. The diversity of side chains in peptides also provides a broad spectrum of potential targets, so they are quite versatile. Additionally, they are less likely to cause immune reactions because they are simpler in structure compared to larger proteins, and there is, therefore, less interaction with unintended targets in the body. Furthermore, Peptides are easily metabolized and are generally non-toxic, meaning when your body breaks them down, their byproducts are amino acids that your body can recycle. However, there are a few drawbacks. Give it to me straight, doc. 
Again, Lei Wang and Friends article on therapeutic peptides is full of great information and it points out that peptides have poor permeability and often struggle to get inside biological barriers like cell membranes and the blood-brain barrier, restricting their access to target sites. This means they may require higher doses or alternate delivery methods to achieve therapeutic results. Are you on any drugs right now and what are you taking later? Um, I'm on... They also have poor stability because they are susceptible to degradation by enzymes in the body, which can cause them to break down too easily, especially when administered orally. Therefore, they may have a short half-life limiting their effectiveness. I was smoking earlier, but it's out of my system. Overall, peptides may just be less effective than other drugs at actually interacting with molecules inside cells. However, being a new area of research, scientists have been actively developing strategies to address these challenges and harness the versatility of peptides for targeted drug delivery and therapy. So peptides seem promising for those who are looking for specific results with little side effects. At this point, people seem willing to try anything that could give them even a fraction of the results of traditional PEDs, if it means regaining their health or at least the appearance of it. For those in the fitness industry who are always looking to optimize performance and mitigate risks, this pitch is appealing. As explained in the Healthline article I mentioned earlier, People often view peptides as a more natural alternative to anabolic steroids and praise them for their ability to boost muscle mass, promote fat loss, and help bodybuilders get the most out of their workout. As Dr. Huberman explains. But the peptides are interesting. They're kind of a middle ground where you're not risking as much in terms of long-term fertility issues. Peptides are certainly popular within the bodybuilding community. Bodybuilders are trying to alter their body composition as quickly and efficiently as possible. Hence why many of them turn to supplements or other aids to reach their desired training and physique goals, says registered dietitian Jillian Kubala. Some of the go-to peptides for fitness performance are GHRHs, GHRPs, GHSs, and IGF-1s. They are all interrelated as they all affect work with the same mechanisms. That is to say, production and release of growth hormone in the body, but do so in slightly different ways. Let's dig deeper into them, shall we? Things that stimulate the release of growth hormone. They're called secretagogues. It sounds like synagogue, but it's secretagogue. GHRHs, or growth hormone releasing hormones, are peptides that work by stimulating the release of GHRH from the hypothalamus, which in turn acts on somatotropic cells in the anterior pituitary, thus indirectly stimulating the release of human growth hormone, or HGH, in the body. GHRPs, or growth hormone releasing peptides, are another group of peptides that stimulate the production and release of human growth hormone. GHRPs bind directly to the GHSR receptor in the pituitary, which causes growth hormone to be secreted. However, they also indirectly stimulate GH secretion by binding with and release of growth hormone releasing hormone, GHRH, from the hypothalamus, which further stimulates GH secretion from the pituitary gland. GHRPs can also amplify the natural bursts of growth hormone that our bodies produce at particular times throughout the day, such as after exercise or during sleep. I'm trying to like get some beauty sleep before I start the gym. Do you mind tucking me in? What, what did I do? These were the only available options for a while until ghrelin was discovered in 1999. This endogenous hormone sparked an entirely new class of hormones known as GHSs or growth hormone secretagogues to be developed. Ghrelin, also known as the hunger hormone, is a naturally occurring peptide hormone that is primarily produced within the stomach, though smaller amounts are produced in other places, such as the pancreas, small intestine, and brain. It mainly helps regulate appetite. Oh. <laughs> However, it also plays a role in the secretion of growth hormone, binding with specific receptors in the hypothalamus and pituitary to do so. Many GHSs are synthetic analogs of ghrelin, meaning they are meant to mimic the effects of ghrelin on the body. Rather than taking growth hormone exogenously, 
you can take things to help your endogenous production. GHSs are very similar to GHRPs in that they act to increase the production of growth hormone, though they include a wider range of compounds. For example, both synthetic analogs of ghrelin as well as other molecules that can stimulate growth hormone secretion through various mechanisms. They also may differ in their potency and selectivity for the GHS receptor the receptor they both bind to in the pituitary. Take this just before you go to bed and you get a little bit of a hot flush, but it feels kind of nice. It's like, uh. Still, the main goal is to boost growth hormone in the body. They help you re recover faster, fat loss, muscle repair. They also stimulate libido. GH or growth hormone is especially important to those within the fitness industry because of its anabolic properties, meaning its ability to enhance muscle growth and loss of body fat. This is mainly because it stimulates the release of IGF-1 in the liver, which plays a crucial role in regulating protein synthesis and is an important factor in muscle development and repair. Like I said, HGH also has fat burning effects. In scientific terms, it increases the rate of lipolysis, the breakdown of fat stored in adipose tissue. I'll tell you right now, a lot of the bodies you see in Hollywood films are on peptides. This is also evidence that it may promote tissue regeneration and cell proliferation, especially for the growth of skeletal muscle and bone. It may also increase the secretion of collagens in different kinds of cultured cells, meaning cells that are grown and maintained outside of their natural environment, typically in a lab. All that to say, growth hormone is essential for the healthy growth and functioning of a body and support of its activity. I yes. love peptides. Now, I mentioned something called IGF-1 being produced in response to growth hormone stimulation. It actually plays a key role in promoting muscle cell growth and repair. In fact, it is the active chemical that directly influences muscle growth, whereas growth hormone just triggers IGF-1. However, unlike the compounds I've been discussing, synthetic IGF-1 peptides are exogenous IGF-1, meant to provide additional IGF-1 in the body, rather than just stimulating a person's natural production. These compounds typically have alterations to make them more resistant to breakdown in the body, allowing them to stay active for longer periods and exert their effects more effectively. Either way, the effects are similar to the supplements that target GH or growth hormone. These modern GH stimulating drugs offer what many believe are a healthier alternative. The same effects with fewer side effects, say sports nutritionist Alina Petra. 60% of the time, it works every time. Still, only a minimal amount of GH stimulating drugs are actually approved by the FDA, and if they are, they are strictly for treating specific medical conditions. Overall, peptides are such a broad category, and while some are used for pharmaceutical purposes, many are not regulated at all, especially those used for sports enhancement. All of the substances I've mentioned so far are on the World Anti-Doping Agency's list of prohibited substances, meaning athletes cannot legally compete with them in their system and you will technically fail a drug test if you do. They want sport to be fair amongst all the competitors. They allowed everyone to just take anything. Some people would be at a huge advantage over their opponents. There are conflicting opinions as to whether or not they actually deserve to be prohibited in sport, whether users can still be considered natty or natural, since even with bioactives, you're still technically supplementing. Are people natty or are they not? Despite these restrictions, many of these drugs are still available for purchase without a prescription from online supplement sites, which can be questionable as to their quality and safety. Consequently, their popularity is still on the rise regardless, and more clinical studies are underway to get a better grasp on their methods of action, their efficacy, and their potential risks. Before we get into the efficacy, as well as the risks and side effects, I just want to mention that because there are so many different types of peptides that affect different bodily functions, and because all individuals are biochemically unique, meaning that they may not react the same way to the same peptide, it's difficult to provide a definitive answer as to whether or not all of these supplements are effective and safe. It's very strange. Already we have different enzymes and some people have more or less of a certain enzyme that breaks it down faster, slower. Most research seems to indicate that further research is actually needed. I can't give you any data or research to actually say that these work, but it made me feel a lot better about my recovery. Like steroids, peptides can be either used by themselves or in stacks. 
meaning in combination with other peptides that are typically targeting a specific issue. Jay points out the importance of being smart and strategic with what peptides you use together and when. If we're hurt, are we gonna be doing healing and fat loss at the same time? Absolutely not. However, if you're trying to gain muscle, it may make sense to use a peptide that increases muscle mass alongside one that helps with joint pain, given they may be sore from lifting heavy weights, though there are peptides that do both. The point is, it's really about tailoring it to your exact needs at that moment, prioritizing and focusing on that. Therefore, to really optimize performance, it's common for many to stack their peptide usage. I can really push it in the gym and I'm not nearly as sore. According to many internet sources, a popular stack that people use for bulking is ipamorelin and CJC1295. CJC1295 is a synthetic analog of GHRH that has been modified to extend its half-life, meaning it will remain active in the body for longer. This has been achieved by adding a DAC or drug affinity complex or fatty chain to the peptide sequence. In a study conducted by Sam L. Teichman, CJC1295 was shown to provide healthy adults with sustained dose-dependent increases in growth hormone and IGF-1 levels and was safe and well-tolerated. I should mention, this peptide is also what's known as a selective GH-releasing peptide. It's considered a selective growth hormone-releasing peptide because it doesn't cause increases in prolactin, aldosterone, or cortisol. This next peptide I'm going to discuss is also selective like that. Ipamorelin, often used in combination with CJC1295, is a synthetic GHS and is a ghrelin mimic, which again is the hunger hormone. So. Along with stimulating the pituitary to release growth hormone production in a pulsatile manner, mimicking the body's natural secretion pattern, this peptide is going to speed up digestion and fat removal. As nurse practitioner Robin Riddle explains, we're not affecting the body's ability to produce its own growth hormone, we're just creating an extra surge. Sermorelin is sometimes used in this stack as well. It is a GHRH, which again stimulates growth hormone production through binding with receptors on the pituitary. As pointed out in an article written by Richard Walker, Sermorelin, unlike those other supplements that boost HGH indirectly, has advantages over straight up exogenous growth hormone because effects are regulated by negative feedback involving inhibitory neurohormones somatostatin, making overdoses difficult, if not impossible to achieve. It sounds like it's good for almost everything. Like yeah. what? <laughs> Tessamorelin is another GHRH that is sometimes used interchangeably in the stack. It works similarly to those I just mentioned, but it is primarily used for its lipolytic effects, which again means that it promotes the breakdown of stored fat cells for energy use. They're amazing. This one is actually approved by the FDA for medical use, particularly in HIV associated lipodystrophy, where abdominal fat distribution occurs. According to a study conducted by Julian Fallitz, tessamorelin reduces visceral fat production by approximately 18% and improves body image distress in HIV infected patients with central fat accumulation and that these changes were achieved without significant side effects or perturbations of glucose. You know, there's a bunch of different ones to target different things that you're wanting to do. That said, all of these are geared at boosting GH levels and all the effects that come along with that. When used together, the effects are hoped to be that much stronger and what one supplement may miss, the other can cover. One of my favorite blends is Ipamorelin with CJC1295. It is an awesome blend. Another popular stack is one used for healing called the Wolverine stack. You inject this at the site of injury and it helps you heal faster than last time. This is a combination of TB500 and BPC157. TB500 is the synthetic fragmented version of the natural molecule thymosin beta-4, which accelerates wound healing. TB4 is said to help cells in skin tissues grow and develop blood vessels, speed up skin cell movement, 
increase collagen production, and reduce inflammation. However, this is a veterinary substance and therefore most of the testing that would validate those claims were on animals. We have to understand that with these peptides, like human data is lacking, okay? So we have to be willing to look a little bit into the future and be flexible with this stuff. I should point out that this is the case for many peptide compounds. But it's pretty unusual to have so much animal literature. I even would go so far as to say quality studies of BPC-157 and its effects in animal models such as rats and mice. However, what has been concluded from research on humans is that thymosine beta-4 has anti-aging potential and may be able to reverse age-related damage in organs like the heart, brain, and kidneys. Therefore, whether it is from the promising research of animal studies, or the direct evidence from human subjects, or simply the testimonies of the many users, the synthetic version of TB4, TB500, seems to be a key staple for people using peptides for the healing of injury physical strain, or even general discomfort. Who is this a perfect candidate for? Um, anybody who wants to stay looking and feeling young. Okay. So, so basically every, everybody. everybody. All um. you guys. <laughs> the other supplement included in the Wolverine stack is probably one of the most, if not the most, talked about peptides on the market, BPC-157. They okay. call it the Wolverine drug, which I love. This peptide in which the BPC refers to body protective compounds is endogenously produced from human gastric juices as explained by fitness and nutrition coach Thomas DeLauer. It is a chain of 15 amino acids that is formed from protective proteins within the gut. It is what is called cryoprotective. It has been shown to promote the healing of different tissues, including skin, muscle, bone, ligament, and tendon, as demonstrated in 2014 study performed by Chung Chang et al. So basically, it is good for repair, especially in tendons and ligaments, which is crucial for intense and consistent training. Angiogenesis. It increases the vasculature. So you get blood vessel formation to areas that potentially have poor vasculature. Angiogenic properties, which refers to a substance's ability to stimulate the growth and development of new blood vessels. Basically, BPC-157 increases blood flow, which can be great for healing. As Derek from More Plates, More Dates explains. If I had an area with low blood flow, that's when I would be looking to something that's pro-angiogenesis. He goes on to say that though it can be useful in some injuries, that is to say minor, not complete tears, essentially any area with reduced blood flow, many athletes are using it proactively, which can be dangerous. A lot of athletes use it as a preventative measure to avoid injury, rehabilitation when it's not necessary, and I think that's overkill and risky as hell. I mean, if your blood flow ain't low, then why increase it? He also points out the increased expression of VEGF from the taking of BPC-157. VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, is a protein that helps grow blood vessels. It's important for things like healing wounds and supporting normal development. However, it can also play a role in diseases like cancer, where it helps tumors grow by creating new blood vessels. As a YouTuber whose entire channel is dedicated to peptides, Peptide Buddy points out, Many cancers cannot spread if it's not supplied by collateral blood flow. Targeting VEGF is being evaluated in managing certain types of cancers. It can even, in rare cases, cause abnormal blood vessel growth in the eyes, which can lead to vision impairment. Overall, VEGF is a key player in blood vessel growth and is involved in various health issues. Therefore, while BPC-157 may be helpful, it should be approached with caution. If you have a tumor, and tumors thrive on increased blood flow, well then by taking BPC-157, you may be either maintaining or accelerating the growth of a tumor that would otherwise be removed or stay small. Another popular substance that is also mentioned in the peptide discussion is MK677 or ibutomorin. MK677, it's not a peptide. We need to not confuse the two. It is the first orally active ghrelin mimic, and it does fall into the category of GHSs but it is technically not a peptide because it is not a short chain of amino acids. Rather, it is a small molecule that interacts with receptors in the body. Being a GHS, however, it is taken mainly for muscle growth and repair and fat loss. There's an oral um, MK677 is one of them that's really awesome that you take as a pill and it's great for increasing stamina and endurance with workouts and putting on more muscle. As with any of the ghrelin mimics, MK677 will increase appetite, 
So if your goal is to lose fat, you definitely want to keep in mind that you'll have to be extra careful about what you're consuming and how much. It can make you very hungry. And so he says, hey, MK can help you lose body fat. Yeah, if you can control your cravings, if you don't eat more. However, as I mentioned, MK677 is not even a peptide. I just thought it was important to mention because so many people lump it into the same category. Jay mentions a few others that are good for longevity and immunity. For example, epithalon, which is known for its ability to induce telomerase activity and telomere elongation in human somatic cells. As we age, our, our telomeres are not shortening. Mm -hmm. They're actually lengthening and they're staying active and they're staying mobile. Vitality boosting peptides are also relevant to fitness performance because an athlete obviously wants to be able to perform as long as possible. And that means avoiding illness and maximizing your lifespan. Um, not very long, not very long. Um, I'm on the other side, obviously at a hill. That said, I could go on and on discussing various peptides because it is such a broad category. There's all kinds of options. I can really tweak and customize depending on what a patient's looking for. For the purpose of this video, however, we've discussed a few of the big ones. It's crucial to remember, however, that anecdotal evidence and individual experiences may not always reflect broader scientific consensus. So again, we need more studies to assess them accurately. And I also want to point out that a decent amount of the studies I read seem to have a noteworthy placebo effect. Put simply by personal trainer James Smith. If you're going to take something that you think is going to help you repair, it's obviously going to impact how you feel about the repair. And I do agree that the people taking these peptides, these supplements meant to be able to optimize your performance with little to no side effects, believe that it's going to work like that. And so it does. Or at least believe that their health is going to improve in general. And so it does. Leading to overall positive health benefits occurring. But only the ones being measured, documented, thus reinforcing its association with the substance. However, legitimate physiological effects of peptides may also occur independently of placebo responses. Placebo effects are and can be oh so real. They really, really trick you into thinking that a given compound is doing something when in fact it's not doing anything different than would an injection of saline. As with any substance, individual reactions vary based on lifestyle differences and pre-existing conditions, dosages, environmental factors, etc. It's difficult to make the claim that this particular substance is going to work for everyone the same way. This is the same with side effects. And again, because different peptides target different things, the side effects, if there are any, vary. However, there are a few general side effects that are possible, some of which are more specific to the peptide's properties, but many can simply result from ingesting a foreign substance into your body with the intention of altering your biochemistry. These can include injection site reactions, allergic reactions, hormonal disturbances, water retention, cardiovascular effects, gastrointestinal disturbances, and insulin resistance. So while yes, they are generally well tolerated, and while yes, many consider them natural alternatives to traditional PEDs, they still need to be exercised with caution. To give Tim Ferriss some credit, you know, he always says uh, the difference between a pill and a poison is the dosage. Again, risks are obviously exacerbated when the supplements are used irresponsibly. However, bodybuilders whose main goal is to get as big as freaking possible are particularly susceptible subscribing to the bigger is better narrative and subsequently thinking more supplement equals equals better effects. For example, as Jay points out, most GH studies show positive effects. However, bodybuilders and performance enhanced yeah. people taking 20 IUs of this stuff a day, combining it with insulin, anabolic agents, that's when you see side effect profile. Not only side effects, but injury as well. So we have to be responsible, realistic, and reasonable with the usage of peptides. And there are few things to take into account in order to do so. Jay also mentions being a smart consumer. This means getting your products from a reliable source, which is echoed by many. Make sure that if you're buying your peptides from a research chemical company that it is, you know, gets good reviews and that you know where they're getting their stuff from. Make sure you get a clean peptides. source. There's some good sources like TaylorMade. You need a prescription is a good pharmacy for peptides. These are clean. I and mean, you, you can't really trust it if you went underground. You should never do that. You should <laughs> never. 
Another thing is to be realistic with your expectations. And by that I mean that most of these peptides are meant to enhance your body's natural production of certain hormones or chemicals, not completely hijack the system as with say, TRT. You're at a certain age, right? And you don't have any natural IGF-1 production left. How is a peptide even gonna work? Even the supplement needs a foundation to work upon. And though these drugs are not steroids, and aren't meant to shut down your body's natural systems, if endogenous production of biochemicals such as GH and IGF-1 is disrupted for long enough, eventually it can be suppressed. The body has an amazing way of regulating itself. Body, again, being a very effective homeostatic mechanism, eventually just gets to a point where it's like, okay, this isn't gonna work anymore. And we build up antibodies. As Jay goes on to explain, the importance of cycling peptide usage to avoid this, suggesting that one take peptides for no longer than eight weeks at a time because the likelihood that the body has built up antibodies by then is high. At this point, the peptide isn't actually effective and it's important to be aware of this so you're not just injecting yourself with stuff for no reason. That way you give your body a chance to recover so that if you did start another cycle, it can actually work how it's intended to. Although if your body truly had developed antibodies to the peptide ingested, any further use in the future would be pointless. You have to know when it's not working anymore. A lot of bros that aren't truly intuitive and in tune to them, and they're like using these things for like 14 weeks. And even in terms of our daily cycle, taking into account when we take supplements, especially those that deal with growth hormone. Some in the medical field advise their patients to fast for a few hours after dinner, do your injection before bed, and then go to bed with the reasoning being. The bed. injection stimulates an immediate release of growth hormone. And once you go to sleep, that's when you naturally have another release. However, Jay Campbell has a completely different suggestion. Doing it right is taking it in the morning. Doing it wrong is taking it at night. Because yeah, then you'll disturb your own production, Yes, right? okay. and you disturb your circadian mm. rhythm. Which can cause the user to feel tired throughout the day, and then the need to constantly nap, which can affect other areas of your life, routine, and in turn, your fitness performance. That said, I always say this, but let me reiterate the importance of covering your bases, as in taking care of yourself and your routine naturally first before taking supplementation. You are your best health care. Anything else is just a bonus. And those bonuses need to be redeemed responsibly. Right, you need to sleep, exercise, good nutrition, uh, good social interactions. You need to do all that stuff, right? The idea isn't to put substances into your body and become dependent on them simply for the sake of improving performance temporarily, but for optimizing health. And if that's truly the case, then anything we do in the quest of bettering our health needs to be done with sustainability in mind. One of the main reasons research into peptides grew so rapidly was because of COVID, because of their potential antiviral properties. The FDA does not want peptides to become mainstream, because if it did, what happens to big pharma? Right, it replaces a ton of drugs. But if peptides are to be a step closer to health, being by nature less harmful on the body, and if properly regulated, less systematically oppressive than what people perceive big pharma to be, then they need to actually lead us to a healthier lifestyle. By that I mean, it is not becoming just another substance that we believe is healthier, but that we misuse as we may steroids. Ultimately, by being a step closer to health, it must be a step towards freedom. And that means not having to rely on any substances, to simply live healthily in balance. Otherwise, it's simply a step sideways. That said, peptides seem to have potential as therapeutic agents. Are they a cure-all? No. But could they help with many issues? There's a lot of research that points to yes. However, further research is needed and is ongoing. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and give it a big thumbs up to feed the algorithm. And if you are already subscribed, make sure that YouTube didn't unsubscribe you from the channel because sometimes they do that. We're working towards 700,000 subs and we would love to have you with us on that journey. If you didn't like the video, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. I read as many comments as I can and we use your feedback to make our videos better for you. Remember, to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Chris Rayner or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 
And don't forget to follow my gym, Human 2.0 Fitness, for free right here on YouTube, where we post content that helps you move better and prevent injury. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.